hi guys welcome back to my channel obs and kind made easy in today's video i'm going to discuss oligohydraminase so what is oligohydraminase this is defined as amniotic fluid that is less than the amount expected for the gestation age based on ultrasound this is when a single deepest vertical pool is less than or equal to two centimeters or the amniotic fluid index is less than five centimeters remember in polyhydraminase we discussed how the deepest vertical pool and the amniotic fluid index is calculated anhydraminase is absence of any measurable pocket of amniotic fluid the normal deepest vertical pocket is two to eight centimeters the normal amniotic fluid index is five to twenty five centimeters Oligohydraminase is divided into two according to severity. There's mild oligohydraminase and severe oligohydraminase. Mild oligohydraminase is when the amniotic fluid index is 5.1 to 8 cm. Whilst in severe oligohydraminase, the amniotic fluid index is less than 5 cm. If you remember in our video of polyhydraminase, we said the amniotic fluid is contributed from several sources, one of them being fetal urine. Most of the amniotic fluid comes from fetal urine the second one is the placenta the third one is the fetal membranes so most of the amniotic fluid comes from the fetal urine the other one is the placenta and the third one is the fetal membranes and of course some of it comes through the umbilical cord Causes of oligohydraminase can be fetal conditions or maternal conditions. For the fetal conditions, you have fetal chromosomal or structural abnormalities. You can have renoagenesis. Renoagenesis is where kidneys, one kidney or both kidneys don't form. So if there's no kidneys, there'll be no urine output. No urine output means reduced amniotic fluid. You can also have obstructed uropathy. In obstructed uropathy, you find that there's something obstructing the urethras here. So this obstruction prevents urine outflow, meaning there's reduced urine output, meaning there's reduced amniotic fluid. Another cause of oligohydraminase is spontaneous rupture of membranes. Remember, in premature rupture of membranes, the amniotic sac breaks spontaneously, and then you can have amniotic fluid coming out. Intrauterine infections can also cause oligohydraminase as well as polyhydraminase. Drugs like prostaglandin inhibitors and SE inhibitors act on the kidneys to reduce urine output in both the mother as well as the fetus. So that reduces urine output resulting in reduced amniotic fluid production. Postmaturity is associated with post date or a post-term pregnancy. Remember that when a pregnancy goes beyond the expected date of delivery, if a pregnancy goes beyond 40 weeks gestation age, the placenta also starts to denature. It starts to expire. So you have placental insufficiency. Where there's placental insufficiency, there's reduced amniotic fluid production. Remember, we said some of the amniotic fluid comes from the placenta as well as the fetal membranes. Intrauterine growth retardation is associated with oligohydraminase. Remember that in IUGR, there's growth retardation. The fetus is not growing as it should be. So this small fetus has reduced fetal blood volume. And if there's reduced fetal blood volume, there's reduced renal blood flow, which results in reduced fetal urine output. And if there's reduced fetal urine output, there's reduced amniotic fluid production. Amyan nodosum has also been associated to cause oligohydraminase. In amyan nodosum, there's failure of secretion by the cells of the amyan covering the placenta to produce amniotic fluid. So remember we said the amniotic sac is made of the amine and chorion. And we said that some of the amniotic fluid comes from the fetal membranes here. So if there's this abnormality of amine nodosum, there's reduced amniotic fluid production. So in amine nodosum, because of the nodules in the amine, there's failure of secretion by the cells. Amine nodosum can cause oligohydraminase as well as oligohydraminase can cause amine nodosum. Maternal conditions that cause oligohydraminase include hypertensive disorders. Remember, in hypertensive disorders, it results in uteroplacental insufficiency. What do we mean by that? There's reduced blood flow to the placenta. So if there's reduced blood flow to the placenta as well as through the umbilical cord, there's reduced blood flow 
to the fetus as well. So there will be reduced fetal urine output as well as reduced blood flow to the placenta, which results in reduced production of amniotic fluid because we said the placenta is also responsible for production of amniotic fluid. Remember what affects the mother also affects the fetus. So if there's maternal dehydration, there's reduced blood volume. And where there's reduced blood volume, there's reduced blood volume going to the fetus. So the fetus is not getting enough blood volume. So there'll be reduced fetal urine output. Reduced fetal urine output is equal to reduced amniotic fluid. Some causes are idiopathic, meaning they are unknown. How do you make a diagnosis of oligohydraminase? So when a patient comes to you and you examine the patient, you find that the height of fundus is smaller than the expected gestational age. And the fetus will be easily palpable. Because there's less amniotic fluid, you can easily pick out the fetal part. And there will be reduced fetal movement. Remember that there's less amniotic fluid and the fetus likes to move around if there's amniotic fluid. But if there's no amniotic fluid, it's like you are swimming in a, an empty swimming pool. You wouldn't swim in an empty swimming pool. So there will be less fetal movements. The most common malpresentation is breech malpresentation. This is probably because it's quite difficult to turn into cephalic presentation because of less amniotic fluid. It's very easy to move if there's amniotic fluid. And there'll be evidence of intrauterine growth retardation if that is one of the causes of the oligohydraminase. Investigations to do in oligohydraminase. So you order an ultrasound for amniotic fluid index to assess the severity of the oligohydraminase and also ultrasound to check if there's any fetal anomalies and also to check for fetal growth. Remember we said IUGR is one of the causes of oligohydraminase as well as oligohydraminase can also cause IUGR. You can also do amniocentesis to check if there's any chromosomal abnormalities. Remember we said chromosomal abnormalities can also cause oligohydraminase. And of course, it's important to screen for maternal conditions that could cause oligohydraminase like hypertension, systematic lupus erythromatosis, antiphospholipid syndrome. Two parameters that will help you make a diagnosis of intrauterine growth restriction on ultrasound are a head circumference to abdominal circumference ratio. Okay, so this ratio also helps differentiate between asymmetrical growth restriction or asymmetrical growth restriction. So the normal value of the ratio is about 1.2 to 1.0. So if this is the ratio, this means it's a symmetrical growth restriction. But if it's more than that, if it's more than 1.2 to 1.0, it means it's asymmetrical. An important information to note is that oligohydraminase with fetal symmetric growth restriction is usually associated with increased chromosomal abnormality. Another investigation you can also do to check if there's placental insufficiency causing oligohydraminase is umbilical artery Doppler. Complications of oligohydraminase. For the fetal complications, you can have a miscarriage or compression deformities. They can be born with compression deformities. These deformities are due to uh, no amniotic fluid. So this results in intra-amniotic adhesions. And some of the common deformities are usually you find that there's a depression in the skull of the fetus or even club foot. They can also have muscle contractures. Remember that when there's amniotic fluid, when there's adequate amniotic fluid, it allows the fetus to move its limbs in the uterus, like exercising. So if there's no exercising, it can result in muscle contractures. Fetal pulmonary hypoplasia is also a complication of oligohydraminase. This is where there's underdevelopment of the lungs. Remember we said in our video of polyhydraminase that one of the ways the fetus gets rid of the amniotic fluid it swallows is through expiration through the lungs. So it comes out as lung fluid. So in oligohydraminase, there's not enough of this exercise. So the lungs do not exercise as much. So there's pulmonary hypoplasia. The other way is that the intrathoracic cavity is reduced when there's oligohydraminase.
so the lungs do not grow as adequately as they should. Cold compression can also be a complication. Remember that there's not much amniotic fluid, so there's less lubrication. So the cord can be easily wrapped around the limbs of the fetus or be pushed against it. And there's increased fetal mortality rate. This is because of miscarriages as well as cord compression that can cause fetal distress as well as fetal pulmonary hypoplasia. Maternal complications of oligohydraminase include a prolonged and painful labor. Remember, amniotic fluid provides a lubrication for the passenger, meaning the fetus. As it goes down, it comes out with amniotic fluid. So it makes the birth less painful and shorter. And there's increased operative interference due to malpresentation, especially in breach. So you have to do maneuvers to help deliver the fetus. Treatment of oligohydraminase. How do you manage a case of oligohydraminase? If the pregnancy is a term, you do continuous CTG monitoring. Why? Because there's a risk of fetal distress in oligohydraminase. And you involve the neonatologist at delivery because of complications like fetal pulmonary hypoplasia as well as fetal distress. If it's mild oligohydraminase and the pregnancy is less than 37 weeks gestation age, you manage as an outpatient. You encourage the patient to drink fluids about 2 liters every day and you measure the biophysical profile at least twice every week. And if the gestation age is about 26 to 34 weeks gestation age, you give them steroids to help mature the lungs. You do induction of labor if there's no contraindication at the seven weeks gestation age. You can attempt to do a transcervical amyo infusion if it's possible. Otherwise, continuous CTG monitoring is recommended. If it's severe oligohydraminase and they're less than 37 weeks gestation age, you admit the patient and, of course, encourage them oral hydration about 2 liters every day. You give steroids, betamethasone or dexamethasone, if the gestation age is less than 34 weeks to help with fetal lung maturity. You only deliver if you're certain that there's fetal lung maturity or if there's fetal distress. Otherwise, you do an induction of labor if there's no intrauterine growth retardation with transcervical amyo infusion if it's possible. Do a cesarean section if there is intrauterine growth retardation. And this comes to the end of our discussion on oligohydraminase as well as amniotic fluid disorders. In the next video, I'm going to try and discuss hyperemesis gravidarum. Please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Thank you.